great. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Maya Marichevich. I'm head of higher education here at the British Library. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to what is our first uh, data debate series. So um, it's an interesting one for us. It's inspired by the new partnership that we have with the Alan Turing Institute, which is the new UK National Centre for Data Science. And that is going to be based here at the British Library. It's an independent centre that is um, just about to open its doors. And the first academic year is going to start here any minute now. So we are still in early days of planning what this new partnership means. And we thought that one of the things to do would be to have um, more public debate on all things to do with data. So welcome. Uh, there is a couple of other important partners for us that are here tonight um, that I'll mention in my introduction. So Arts and Humanities Research Council and Economic and Social Sciences Research Council who, who are really uh, are important long-term supporters of research in these areas and that really inspire us to have this sort of debate. What we're hoping to do is have a chat about technology, about algorithms, but also to reflect on human behavior, on society, on big society, as well as maybe as, as big data. So um, that's intention, and thank you for coming for our first attempt uh, to do this. So um, I'm just going to tell you a few words how tonight is going to work. So we have our excellent panel here, and they are going all to chat and um, tell us a little bit and give us some food for thought. Um, and then we are going to have discussion. So it's up to you and your participants in this as much as our panel is. And we are looking forward to, um, to what happens there. Um, so a um, few words. Uh, we are filming this session. So if you want later on to point people to it, they will be somewhere on YouTube. Uh, and also, um, there's some feedback form outside at the end better than feedback form, there's going to be some wine. So uh, stay around, there will be chat, and there will be some wine, and we hope uh, the discussions continue out there. Um, there is one change we are having tonight that I need to apologize for. Our panel is slightly different than planned. We had a cancellation yesterday from Jin schultz melling from the Facebook, um, and apologies for that. Um, we did what we do in these situations. We asked a friend. <laughs> so uh, the person who was very lucky to be in the UK at this particular time in Jefferson Bailey's, who is the director of web programs at the Internet Archive. So we are very grateful for him to stand in and please give him some extra love because he didn't know about this until uh, yesterday afternoon. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so he's well prepared, but we know that he has extensive knowledge in this area. So I'm sure we'll have a great input. Um, and also, thank you very much for Timandra, David, and Helen. Um, so uh, I'm going to hand over to uh, Timandra in a minute. Demandra Harkness, who's our chair. I'm just before that going to uh, say to you that uh, we are very lucky to have Demandra. Uh, she has so many hats, it's, it's impossible to choose. Um, Radio 4 presenter, newspaper columnist, science speaker, comedian, and also for all of you, you can have lots more of Demandra because there's excellent and fantastic book that's called Big Data, Does Size Matter? So uh, I recommend that to you and I'll hand over to Timandra. Thank you, Maya. Uh, yes, it's my job to steer the good ship of a debate through the next hour and a half or so. Uh, what we're going to do is each of the speakers have been asked to keep their introduction short, not more than 10 minutes. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll probably have a little discussion just between the four of us to draw out any ideas that they've raised. Um, but then there will be lots of time for you all to join in. So I do hope that as they make their short introductions and as we have a little initial discussion, you'll be making a mental or even a physical note of anything that you want to throw in. Don't feel you have to limit yourself to questions. Feel free to ask questions because we've got three extremely knowledgeable people. But we're also interested in hearing your ideas and your thoughts. So there'll be plenty of time for that. Um, I think we probably have a roving microphone, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes, good. But th that's, that's a little way off yet, so don't worry about that yet. 
Bec uh, because we're filming, obviously. If you're not meant to be here, if you said you were going to be somewhere else <laughs> and you want to ask a question, like put on a big hat or disguise your voice or something, get some privacy tips from David. Uh, so we have three speakers and uh, they're going to speak for about 10 minutes each. If they start overrunning, I'm going to subtly wave a piece of white paper under their noses. So hopefully they will know then that it's time to start speeding up and say all the same stuff, but twice as fast. Uh, uh, and I'm going to introduce them all and then, uh, and then let them loose on you. So first of all, on my immediate left, we have Helen Margots, Professor of Society and the Internet at Oxford University. She's a professor of political science and uh, she's the author of a book, Political Turbulence, how social media shape collective action. So you can see exactly why we wanted to invite her. She's the director of the Oxford Internet Institute and a faculty fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, based right here. Uh, then we have David Vincent, also an author of two books, Privacy, A Short History, and I Hope I Don't Intrude, Privacy and Its Dilemmas in the 19th Century. Uh, he's at the Open University. He's a historian of privacy and secrecy but he's also a visiting fellow at uh, an institute at Cambridge called CRASH, with two S's, which it, I suspect is less dramatic than it sounds and more <laughs> intellectually dense, but still a really good title. <laughs> and then on my right, uh, as Maya said, stepping in heroically at very short notice. Replacing Facebook. Replacing Facebook. <laughs> replacing the whole of Facebook. When you get home tonight, you'll find Facebook is not there. It's just basically a picture of Jefferson's face. <laughs> <laughs> and if you remember how to spell his name, then you get access to the whole internet archive of the whole internet, which apparently is in a church in San Francisco. So no, seriously. So Jefferson Bailey is the director of archiving at the Internet Archive in San Francisco, which is apparently based in an old church. So basically the whole of the internet is preserved in an old church Not in San Francisco. Not all of it, but a lot of it. What? OK. <laughs> but <laughs> the internet is archived in an old church in San Francisco, and, uh, and Jefferson has worked in digital preservation, not only there, but also uh, public libraries, museums, the Library of Congress, the US National Archive. So uh, his work is all about web archiving and then giving access to researchers. So in many ways, I think we have a much better guest than Facebook because we all know they inevitably would have only given us what they were allowed to say. And then instead of asking questions, you'd probably have to just put your thumb up and <laughs> say whether you liked it or not. Uh -uh. So, uh, Helen, uh, take 10 minutes. Tell us, tell, us about, uh, tell us about social media and politics. I will do. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm going to try and answer this question um, with respect to politics and political behaviour, uh, but I hope at the end I might kind of widen it out a bit and that it might you might think it applies to other sorts of behaviour as well, what I'm going to say. So the first thing I want to say is that um, politics increasingly takes place on social media. Um, if you think of any of the things that we normally construe to be politics, collective action, political participation, maybe engagement with some governmental organisation, political discussion, deliberation, elections, political campaigning. It all takes place, or, or at least plays out, on social media. That is, that even if you were to go and watch a televised debate during an election campaign, um, most of the discussion about that and the um, uh, reaction to that will be visible on social media in some way. Um, and the point there is therefore that we, uh, we, 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 we're not really asking what's the use because it's not some sort of nice extra, oh, here's some net extra information about what's going on. It's the main source of what's going on. That's what I want to suggest. Um, and just as that applies to all the kind of um, activities of politics, it also applies to kind of the dark side of politics. It applies to terrorism, radicalization, um, the far right, hate speech, racism, riots. All those things um, are coordinated and communicated um, to a very large and increasing extent on social media. So all of those things are visible somewhere in social media data. 
um, and we therefore can't ignore social media data. So that's the first point. Of course we need social media data. Um, you know, in, in some ways you might argue it's the most important sort of data if we want to understand the political system. There's another key point here about social media um, and, um, uh, uh, po uh, and political change. Um, as Tamandra said, um, uh, I and some of my colleagues um, at the Oxford Internet Institute and, uh, and UCL as well um, wrote a book called Political Turbulence, looking at the relationship between collective action and social media. And in that book, we observed and argued that a key driver is change, a, 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 a key driver of social media related change is that it makes possible very small acts of political participation, sort of tiny acts of political participation, that in an earlier era weren't really possible. Liking something, following something, signing a petition, um, uh, following, uh, following somebody, um, viewing something. Um, there's evidence now that suggests that people share news items more than they read them. They share them without reading them, in fact. And you might construe that as a political act. You're drawing somebody's attention to something. Sharing a photo. Think of the influence of, of, of photographs like the one of the dry and Syrian boy or the f German football stadium with a sign saying refugees welcome during um, the refugee crisis of last summer, this summer, sadly every summer. Um, <laughs> these are very small acts of political participation. And they're, they're kind of new because in an earlier era, the transaction costs would have been too great. Um, politics has become less lumpy than it used to. You don't have to um, necessarily join a political party or uh, you, you don't have to, uh, uh, as Oscar Wilde said, the problem with socialism is it does cut so dreadfully into the evenings. Um, <laughs> you, you, you don't have to have your evenings cut into, you can do a little bit of politics. And that is drawing a lot of people, including people that we used to think don't participate in politics, into politics, particularly young people. So you, you can have the situation that I had um, a few months ago when my 14-year-old son says at breakfast, I'm friends with Jeremy Corbyn on Snapchat. <laughs> um, and the point about those tiny acts of politics is, of course, they are reflected in social media data, but they are only reflected in social media data. They aren't anywhere else. So that's another reason why you need them. Now, in that book, which I won't go into the details of that book, but we did argue that the way that those tiny acts scale up into important mobilizations and sort of waves of support um, and, and possibly demonstration and protest is actually very unpredictable and unstable, and it's making politics more un unpredictable. Um, it's, it's making unpredictable things happen, and that's why unpredictable things keep, keep, keep happening. So in another sense, that data is a kind of clue to that unpredictability. As well as getting unpredictability, we ought to get some capacity to predict what's going on using that kind of data. And as a social scientist, and I'm sure the social scientists here in the audience, it's actually incredibly exciting to have this sort of data because it's real-time transactional data about what people are really doing in politics. It's not a survey about what people think they did or think they might do, um, and uh, 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 something that people are quite often unlikely to remember. It's real data about what real people really did. So in that sense, it's exciting, and it's a way to c cope with the unpredictability of modern politics. But to move on to the problems with that, because obviously that's painting a very sort of utopian vision of how we understand politics in the age of social media. Actually, social media data is, is, is very difficult to get hold of. And that may seem counterintuitive because we all attend kind of or we hear or we read articles about how we're awash with data, the data deluge, um, data swimming around, you know, it's like we're swimming around in data. Um, actually, um, it's easy to get hold of Twitter data. Twitter has an open um, application programming interface, an API, which um, means that you can actually get hold of data in an, in an open way. Um, and that's great. And that means that there are hundreds and hundreds of articles about how people behave on Twitter. The trouble is that most people don't use Twitter. Actually, more people use Instagram than they use Twitter. But Instagram belongs to Facebook, and it's very difficult to get hold of Facebook data. Facebook doesn't have an open API, um, and most Facebook data is not available um, for the purposes of understanding what's going on in politics. Um, 
so, uh, and there's lots of ways in which kind of most social media data we don't actually have. The average young person is active on five social media accounts, and any of you with children will know, you've probably heard of two of them, and you haven't heard of the other three, something like that. Um, so to get a handle on any kind of politics they're doing on those platforms is actually very difficult indeed. Um, Snapchat, um, which would have reflected my, my son's enthusiasm for Jeremy Corbyn, um, is, is deleted or is supposed to be deleted. We were just talking about that. It's supposed to be deleted as soon as it's been um, as soon as sent. WhatsApp is encrypted. Um, I could go on and on about all the different ways. So some data is available. You can get Twitter data. You can get um, Wikipedia data is freely available. You can see what people have been doing on Wikipedia. But a lot of it isn't. And if you want to buy it, um, it's actually extremely expensive, out of the out of reach of most research organisations. Um, so that means that kind of this new cap this new both necessity and capability to understand po uh, politics, it's largely in the hands of internet corporations. Um, they're using that data all the time to make their services better. I say better in scare quotes because, of course better but also more profitable um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and so that they kind of form an ever greater part, part of our lives. Um, so they are using that data but they're not publishing it very much or actually analysing the effect it's having on political behaviour and political systems um, to, uh, uh, or at least they're not sharing any analysis of that kind they do. And on the occasions when they do, they're inclined to get completely lambasted, as many of you will have heard of the Facebook about the, the experiment where Facebook were, not you, of course, I'm just pointing to where Facebook would have been. <laughs> 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 Facebook was supposed to be manipulating our emotions by feeding us negative sort of uh, negative stories and seeing how that affected our mood. Now, of course, they do that. Any company that operates an internet-based platform does that kind of experiment all the time um, to see the effect of different m modes of design. Um, but the fact is they're doing that behind kind of closed doors and we don't know so much about what's going on. And of course that's important, um, not just because it's, we're, we're missing a trick as far as understanding um, goes, but because also, of course, when they do make changes to their platform and observe the effect, they're also shaping our political behaviour. Now, Facebook wasn't invented for politics. There's lots of politics going on there, but most of the time people are doing other things. Facebook is a platform which was established you know, initially with the idea of helping shy young men find girls, basically. I mean, that was the kind of sort of idea of it. Um, but I've nearly finished. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of politics is going on there. And when changes happen, so for example, when a social media platform introduces trending information saying which are the most popular tweets, for example, or the most popular anything, we know from decades of social science research that that affects the way you behave, that affects how much you like something. We tend to like more popular things and not like so much less popular things. So any kind of platform change is actually um, likely to change political behaviour and that's quite, that's quite important. Facebook, for example, um, a couple of years ago had a very large experiment with 61 million kind of subjects, as it were, where they, um, where they saw the, uh, they tested the effect of telling people how many of their friends had voted, had turned out to vote, on that person's likelihood of voting. It didn't have a very good big effect, but it, it did have an effect. It's supposed to have encouraged 66 million pe uh, 66,000 people to go, to go and vote. Okay, you can say that's great, that's Facebook doing, doing good, not evil, and of course that is good, but it does put a lot of kind of potential um, in the hands of that, that corporation because, of course, we know that turnout is differential according to which party, you know, some parties are more likely, supporters of some parties are more likely to turn out than others. So there's a possibility there. I'm not saying in any sense that they're, they, they're doing it, but there's a possibility there for them to have quite a profound effect on um, um, an electoral outcome. So... Finally. I'll finally... <laughs> <laughs> I'll end there. Um, <laughs> of course, we must use social media data to understand politics. We have to. We won't understand it without it. 
Um, but there are some ramifications for that in terms of who owns that data um, and what they can do with it and other people can't. Thank you, Helen. I will come back. You can shoehorn more points in later. <laughs> so, David, I think you're going to take us back a little in time for a longer perspective. Yeah, I'm going to start with uh, Charles Dickens, whose name is, uh, I see, over a room uh, in this building. In the 1830s, he was setting out uh, as a writer at the same time as the modern statistical movement took off, uh, fueled by the Great Reform Act. Amateur enthusiasts and government officials discovered the power of counting. It was the beginning of big data avant la lettre. It was seen to be possible to express the complexity of social conditions and behaviour in, in summary tables of figures and thereby measure progress and the need for reform. And Dickens responded to the new statistical movement with a terrific statistical essay purporting to be a full report of the first meeting of the Mudford Association for the advancement of everything. <laughs> he mocked the use of modern communications, parodied the counting for the sake of counting, and attacked the amoral measurement of human suffering. A central figure in his meeting was Mr. Slug, so celebrated for his statistical researches, who in the course of the meeting found himself in personal jeopardy. Intelligence has just been brought to me that an eld elderly female in a state of inebriety has declared in the open street her intention to do for Mr. Slug. Some statistical returns compiled by that gentleman relative to the consumption of raw spirituous liquors in this place are supposed to be the cause of the wretch's animosity. Now, as a satire, this was funny, uh, entertaining, and completely wrong. The entire point of the paper-based statistical movement, as it developed in Britain through the 19th and well into the 20th century, was that it did everything possible to distance information from identifiable persons, whether inebriated or not. In every context, statisticians Statisticians sought to create l'homme moyen, the average man, devoid of identity and difference. The summit of their achievement, which was the annual decennial census, recorded names, but only to check that the uh, enumerators weren't inventing their returns. The published tables were fully anonymous, and the overworked General Registry Office resisted every suggestion to link official databases. And for this reason, the censuses actually provoke very little hostility. The modern concern about privacy began with the growing use of mainframe computers in the 1960s and the immediate recognition that they would permit data linkage on a scale which had been impossible before. Privacy had only been defined as a human right in the UN and European declarations of human rights in 1948, 1950. But within less than two decades, it had acquired a zombie status, forever being killed by digital communications, only to rise up with a knife in its head to be killed over again. Can I have my other slide, please? Yeah. <laughs> That's my one slide tonight. <laughs> the threats to privacy are real, and they're growing in their scale and complexity, but if we're to understand the direction of change, we need to find answers to two questions which have been on the table since the inaugural meeting of the Mudfog Society. What information is being collected and how is it being communicated? The answer to the first question is that we are a good way down the road to identifying the inebriate elderly female. If she's got a loyalty card, then the local Tesco knows what she's doing, as of course with the local shopkeeper in her time. If she's being treated as a doctor for her alcoholism, there's a danger for her address and her medical profile being linked. If she's discussing her outrage with the Mudfog Society or its successor with children or friends on Facebook, well, we might have had another debate about that tonight. The association of the breach of privacy with the exposure of shameful behaviour has now become a convention in the popular media. Yet the scale and reach of digital surveillance still has difficulty penetrating far beyond overt social or antisocial behaviour. For all the influence of modern consumer culture, identity cannot be fully summarised uh, in terms of online shopping preferences. The function of privacy is to patrol the space 
within which the individual can know themselves and manage their most intimate relationships. Even an elderly consumer of spiritual liquors, spiritual liquors has the capacity to choose what is known about their innermost feelings and communications. In our own times, as Sen has just been discussing, it's not the old but the young whose self-exposure through web-based channels appears to exemplify the transparency of the digital society. But close examination of their messaging reveals conscious and sophisticated constructions of preferred versions of themselves, some experimental, some partial, others deliberately misleading. Second question is how, is how rather than what is also a matter of carefully calibrating change. Privacy is not just a matter of being let alone, cry the adolescents down the ages. Rather, it's a condition within which the most valued personal relations can flourish. Such exchanges in Dickens' world are still to a large extent in our own, embrace every available mode of communication. Individuals know that they know each other because they require so little effort for the effective exchange of emotion or information. Back in the late 16th century, the first modern essayist, Montaigne, marveled at the fecundity of face-to-face, body-to-body language. <coughs> After all, he wrote, lovers quarrel, make it up again, beg favors, give thanks, arrange secret meetings, and say everything with their eyes. What about our hands? With them we request, promise, summon, dismiss, long list there. And what else? With a variety and multiplicity rivaling the tongue. Now Dickens was a product of and did much to shape a new popular literary culture. Just three years after his Mudfog papers, we get the Penny Post uh, and the rapid enlargement of the realm of virtual privacy. Nonetheless, face-to-face communication remains central to the conduct of intimate relations at all levels of society. Over time, it's been supplemented by the post, telephone, and now the digital media. And these innovations have complicated, but they haven't invented the essential risk register of the technology of privacy. You go back 15th century and you find correspondents having to balance the game in maintaining intimacy over distance with the danger of a letter getting lost or falling into the wrong hands. It can be argued that the driving desire to maintain networks of friends and lovers in the digital era has overwhelmed any individual's capacity to control the danger of surveillance. Facebook's multimedia intimacy is more complex and more vulnerable than the letter or the telephone conversation. And particularly after the last couple of weeks, Mark Zuckerberg is never going to attain the same level of trust that's long been invested in the familiar postman. Yet within social media and across the range of messaging that still occurs on a face-to-face basis, Strategies of concealment, ways of embodying meaning in verbal and physical devices that are fully meaningful only for the interlocutors remain powerful protectors of privacy, which at least in part explains why the use of the social media has been little affected by the continual exposure of its dangers. We've still got difficulty teaching algorithms to comprehend irony. Progress is being made with devices that can read facial expression, although less than is often claimed. Down the road, machines may be able to interpret tone of voice, gesture of hands, and the meaning of touch. Never say never. Just be cautious where predictions are linked to anticipated share price. Now, at the end of history lies the world lately described by Yuval Noah, Noah Harari in Homo Deus, where personal privacy is not so much destroyed as rendered redundant. Where the data religion has replaced Dickens' omniscient God, identity only has meaning in connectivity. But if you read his book closely, you find that like most prophets of doom, Harari has given himself a get-out clause. The dataist revolution, he writes in the final chapter, will probably take a few decades if not a century or two. And in the speeded up history of the digital world, that's sometime never. It's not over yet. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you, David. Tempered words of doom. (laughs) (laughs) So, Jefferson. Okay. 
with your, you had hours, possibly <laughs> hours to prepare this. So, uh, give us your best off the cuff remarks. Sure. Uh, well, first I would like to thank Facebook for canceling, um, <laughs> giving me this opportunity. Um, so I am director of Web Archiving at Internet Archive. For those that aren't familiar with Internet Archive, it, it's a nonprofit digital library uh, in San Francisco. It's at archive.org. Uh, it, it is the largest cultural heritage web archive. Uh, we don't collect the entire internet, which would be quite difficult, um, but the web archive is uh, started in 1996 when the organization was founded, uh, and it is about 15 petabytes currently, and we collect about a billion URLs per week uh, is the scale. Uh, internet Archive also has lots of other activities um, as far as digital library uh, e-books, uh, digitizing movies, and, and, and all sorts of uh, digital cultural heritage. So the mission is universal access to all knowledge, and we do try to live up to that in uh, scale, both in acquisition, preservation, and especially in open access. Um, so uh, this would, I figured this would be a fun talk uh, to talk both about the web, and social media is both of the web, but also I think, as, as Helen suggested, we are at an interesting moment that uh, social media is fracturing a bit uh, in the publication platforms and its accessibility via uh, internet protocols and things like that. Um, so, but the place of the, the web in the archive, and I will talk sort of from the archival long-term perspective that doesn't necessarily uh, prognosticate around intended use into the future, uh, but more focuses on making that content accessible for any use in the future. Uh, so the web is uh, 27 years old or so, depending on uh, when you argue that Tim Berners-Lee launched, uh, launched his idea for, the, uh, for hyperlinks and, and the web itself, uh, obviously built on technologies that are a, a bit longer than that. Um, the web in the archive is interesting in that uh, its, its emergence was technological. It was obviously uh, scholarship-oriented. It emerged from... Uh, in the U.S. Uh, military activities. The Defense Department funded a lot of the early research. Um, so it was about sharing knowledge, but not necessarily about the personal creation of personal records or artifacts or, or broader social communication. Um, so uh, its place is a historical record. Uh, many institutions like IA and like BL as well uh, collected the web uh, pretty early in its, in its emergence, but many Libraries and archives and preservation institutions took longer to do that. Uh, but what has uh, certainly happened as its exponential growth has gone on for a number of decades now uh, is that it has consumed all media and all forms of uh, record or artifact creation, um, person correspondence, personal papers, uh, obviously photography, moving image. Um, they are all mostly web published, so it is a publication platform that is sort of taken over all what used to be very siloed uh, of formats. Uh, so the web, the archived web, is, is not just a social record, but it's now a record of te technology and change and communication methods. Um, so social media, I think when we talk about social media data, we do talk about Facebook and Twitter and all the current ones, uh, but of course social media platforms are this, themselves historical artifacts. So for those who don't remember, GeoCities, certainly one of the biggest ones and most popular that was acquired by Yahoo in the early 2000s and then uh, abandoned by Yahoo in 2009. So it was shut down uh, and many preservation efforts did try to archive as much as uh, GeoCities uh, at that time as possible. So there are good snapshots of it uh, before it was shut down. Uh, but, but certainly not in its entirety. And so Internet Archive does not collect all of the web. It is uh, a big data set, but uh, there's too much, too much web to get. Um, others, Friendster was a, a very popular social network in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, and it was also abandoned uh, and is now, I think, a video, video game site. Um, so other social media in the archive, uh, of course, uh, Library of Congress had an agreement with Twitter in the late 2000s to get a, a, a feed uh, of the Twitter firehose for archival purposes, uh, and that is an exciting initiative that has not figured out uh, access, and so I'll talk about access and research methodologies a little bit. So uh, I, 
in talking about social media data, it is both uh, interesting to look at the historical uses, the research challenges, and the preservation and capture challenges. Uh, and especially just to note with GeoCities and Friendster, it's a very uh, ephemeral, like all the web. So the average life side of, lifetime of a website is in 96 days if you do the studies. Uh, and you'll see commercial entities, uh, GeoCities, Friendster, but certainly one would imagine, don't listen to, don't stop paying attention to Facebook, but of course Facebook will be gone someday, YouTube will be gone someday. So when you're thinking in the sort of archival scale uh, of preservation and access, um, the ephemerality of the commercial entities that social media is tied to uh, is actually quite short. Um, so what are current preservations around social media? I come from the Cultural Heritage Library Archives world, uh, and the scale and the challenge of collecting social media and web content uh, is quite large. So it is uh, collaborative, it's multi-institutional, it's uh, shared technologies uh, and shared expertise. Uh, going on from a cultural nonprofit uh, preservation aspect. Um, the challenges that are social media specific are what we've discussed in their commercial gated uh, sort of walled garden fashion. Uh, They're often very challenging to traditional methods of web uh, capture. So crawling and crawlers don't often operate well on very dynamic or uh, JavaScript driven uh, web portals, uh, of which social media, of course, is a, a very fancy one. Uh, Snapchat and others emerging, especially mobile, uh, mobile-only devices and social media channels. Uh, there are no great scalable ways to preserve those what will be important historical records. So preservation efforts are, are, are underway, but uh, the, the pace of change of the web and technology and commercial industry, of course, is much, uh, much faster than the the funding and mandate of libraries and archives. Um, but we do at IA and, and other preservation institutions capture a lot of, of social media. And uh, it's interesting in facilitating research use of those beyond just uh, the sort of Wayback Machine replay method, uh, which are data driven. So it is very easy to get, uh, as Helen mentioned, Twitter data via the APIs. Uh, and it is easy for us to extract and make accessible other social media platforms that don't have APIs, but that we can make uh, archival copies of via crawling or even donated data methods. Um, but what we found is not just the infrastructure challenges for historical use, but especially the methodological challenges to using social media data. Uh, certainly humanities and much of social and political science uh, Analysis is based on monographs and text and sort of item level analysis uh, and not really the sort of big data mining activities that are more common in the hard sciences uh, and computer sciences. So data mining is emerging as far as using social media data, but uh, still hasn't necessarily caught up uh, with the sort of analytical approaches. Uh, that a lot of historians bring to it. So the other challenge, of course, is how are we capturing this social media data? And that is very hard to document because it is very technology dependent. Uh, so methods of capture and how we decide how much to crawl of what social media platform, what data gets acquired by the crawler and what doesn't, uh, how it discovers new content algorithmically uh, and in configurations are very hard to document. And so the record that we're giving to people is large and quite scalable and suitable for global big analysis in, in social and cultural uh, research, uh, but also the method of acquisition, the method of preservation uh, is very challenging to document in a way that is easy for a researcher to use and understand. Um, uh, but it does capture all sorts of content. and so. Uh, it, it's interesting, I think, and then social media has been very platform, social media research and analysis has been very platform oriented. You study Twitter, you study Instagram, um, but of course these methods of publication and communication, social media, uh, are parts of other archival and historical records that people are creating. So emails and personal paper collections and software and VMs and spreadsheets and uh, other forms of data that people create either 
uh, in their daily lives are uh, as part of the research process. Uh, those both are involved with social media and associated with them, um, but also separate. So you, I think social media and its use uh, has an interesting possibility for a sort of uh, confluence across uh, record types. And so that, that, that should be interesting to see as far as uh, the research methodologies evolve. Uh, and then just sort of the final point is the larger archival imperative around social media capture and preservation. Uh, and these are points that are also applicable to the web itself. Uh, it is obviously the sort of defining publication platform of our generation. It's one that changes and disappears quite quickly. Um, far beyond the ability of preservation institutions to capture it all or capture big parts of it. Um, but some of the other, uh, I think, amazing aspects of our moment in time as far as preservation and use of social media and the web are the sort of plurality of representation that come on these platforms. So the, the archive in the historical view going back centuries has often been of the rich, of the famous, uh, of the, the powerful. So its representation of societies and cultures over time has also often been of a very small strata of society and a, of a very limited view of daily activities and people's lives and ideas and cultures. Um, so social media and the web have given us a very uh, amazing but probably very brief moment in time to sort of drastically expand uh, the archival record and what we can present to the future as a, uh, a collection that represents our time. Um, so I think when we get to what's the use uh, for the librarian and archivist, uh, we tend to not know what use is. Um, we have, just as a, a crazy example, uh, someone uploaded to Internet Archive all. So Kmart is this very big shopping uh, center, like. Walmart before Walmart, and they used to just have music, bland music, uh, that played throughout the stores that they actually created themselves, so it was not piped in or satellite fed. And someone, a uh, store manager, just recorded hundreds of hours of it and uploaded it to Internet Archive, and it was the most popular thing in the <laughs> Internet Archive for like oh, months, people listening to music from Kmart's. <laughs> um, so that that would have such like cultural meaning to people, uh, while of course we all uh, have all these other amazing collections of personal papers, and people just wanted to hear the music and look at the GeoCities web pages. Um, so it's very hard to predict use, uh, both for you know scholarship purposes, but also for you know the meaning of of individual uh, citizens. So uh, in social media, in its format agnostic mode, its scalability. Uh, its potential to be used by so many different uh, levels of society creates a, a, a great corpus that'll be uh, very interesting for future use and is very meaningful to preserve. Thank you very much. Yep. Well, lots of very different things from very different angles being thrown up there. Um, and I hope you have lots of thoughts going on, but I am going to exercise my prerogative to for, jump in first with some thoughts and questions of my own across what the three of you have said. The, there's a picture here of uh, being able to use social media as quite a unique resource for contemporary social science and other study, uh, but also presumably for the historian. And I thought it was quite interesting, David, that you, you seem to talk about it uh, rather in terms of people's experience of having their social media collected and of being studied, rather than with your historian's hat on as something that you, you might want to dive into. Is it, is it because you have a kind of disquiet about whether studying people's social media is a kind of modern version of the statistical movement where everybody is reduced to their statistics? Because something, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you two, but it's something what I'm getting from you is that uniquely really being able to capture people's tweets and Facebook posts and off the cuff interactions is a unique way of capturing people speaking for themselves 
that has not really been possible previously in history. Um, so I'd be interested to hear all, all, all three of you, your, your thoughts on that, whether that's something on which you're, you're disagreeing. Who'd, who'd like to come back on me first? Well, if I just start, but partly it's to do with practice. Um, as an historian, uh, and a historian of the 19th century in, in, in my basic trade, uh, I, I read books and words, and I am unskilled uh, and intimidated by the prospect, uh, and probably too old to retrain myself now, to use digital data in its raw form as a basis for my own research. I can just plead. I mean, my children mock me when I say it's not my period. Uh, when <laughs> anything comes up that I don't know about in the past, and I would want to say the same thing in terms of you just asked a question about the modern digital age. But I am interested in privacy over the long run, and I have looked at, not directly, but at least at, at, a, at a wide range of studies of the contemporary use of the digital media. Um, and the one point I'd make, the, the one open area for me at least, and I was talking to Helen about this briefly before we began, is moving across the piece, we do need a body of researchers, who won't include me, who are capable of looking at how given individuals and groups, age groups, work across all the media. How they use digital media, but also how they use older forms of media, correspondence, telephones, how they talk to each other, how often they walk about in complete silence. And that kind of breadth of work, on the whole, is not taking place at the moment. There's a huge amount of work focusing directly on the use of the digital media. But it's the spread of skills and practices is still rather outside uh, the current research frame. So, Helen, is this then a case of looking under the lamppost that you study the social media content because that's what is there? Well, I guess the argument that I was making was that it's what's there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you need the lamp, you, you need the lamppost. Um, I, I mean, because that is, that is politics. I mean, that was the point I was trying to make. I think you can't sort of not look at it. So it's not just that that's where the light is. It's also that actually because that's where the light is, that's where what you want to study is happening. Yes, because actually there isn't a lamppost. Well, there's a lamppost over Twitter, as we both said, because that's relatively easy to look at that. But I mean, really, actually looking at political behaviour is actually in many ways much more difficult now. Um, looking at digital political behaviour is in many ways actually more difficult <laughs> than looking at other <laughs> sorts of behaviour, just b because of the problems I mentioned with that, um, with, with, with getting hold of data, but also the point um, that David made about, about skills is really important because I think that is also changing our political landscape. Um, the capacity of, and I'm not just talking about researchers here, I'm talking about political institutions themselves. So you could argue that there's all sorts of new data available for policy making, available for government to make better services, to make policies that more accurately reflect people's needs and preferences. But they're terrified, you know, in many, in many ways, terrified of doing that because of the kind of, uh, not, not just logistical problems of getting hold of data, but the technical expertise that is required to do these kind of things. Um, and that applies also to sort of changing the playing field of electioneering, for example. So in the last election, um, the Conservatives um, spent nine times more on Facebook advertising, targeted Facebook advertising, than um, the Labour Party. We'll never know. Um, Facebook certainly think that made a big difference, but we'll never really know because that's a sort of private world where people encounter an advertisement. We don't know who saw the advertisement or you know, what sort of effect it had on them. That's a very, very difficult thing to study. Um, and in fact, it's the big, you know, you see this in, in, in the US and, and to some extent the UK, it's the big parties with the big data operations that are, 
are, are, are going to win. It's like almost like a re-centralization in some ways, in, in, you know, a kind of counter to the kind of decentralization that I was talking about at the beginning. You've got that kind of counter trend as well. So um, it's changing the playing field, this need, need for expertise. So yeah, no, I, 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 do, I just don't think there's a very good lamppost. So far from, <laughs> far from studying it because it's readily available. Yeah, no. You're, yeah. you're actually, you're more like a 21st century Charles Booth trying to go out and find the hidden, the hidden yeah. conversations. I mean, I think it's something we've got to do because I mean, the census actually, I, w I was just talking to a US policymaker just before I came here. We were talking about the US census. I mean, the US Census now costs, it costs 17 billion, apparently, the US Census. Um, and it's every 10 years, you know. Does that really encapsulate so social, political and economic change at the moment, do you think? Um, you know, I, I think we've no option, but to, it's, it's, it's kind of broken. <laughs> well, they, they are talking very much about abolishing our decennial census here and using combining other kinds of information yeah in, and they've been talking about it that. they've been talking about it for many years but it's not an easy thing to do that's the point and I don't think anybody who sort of you know encounter sort of uses this stuff thinks that it's easy in the 19th century they didn't understand sampling uh, and that's why the census was set up in the form that it was uh, now they do <laughs> uh, and and, and the, 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 there are other alter alternatives, but it is going to be a very difficult transition to, uh, to to manage. And partly for those very reasons that you're raising of trust and privacy, because people tend to be quite honest with the census because it's seen as separate from other kinds of information. Whereas there was, I think, uh, in the era of the poll tax, which most of you are probably too young to remember, but there were a lot of people that did not fill in the census because they were afraid it would be used to track them down and make them pay the controversial poll tax. So anyway, we, I'm in danger of letting my own interests outrun this. <laughs> so as an archivist then, are you in a position to be able to help researchers to get access to people's voices and conversations as a, as a more broad-based resource? I mean, this is also obviously... You know, you have your, your church in San Francisco, but obviously in this very building, the, the Alan Turing Institute and the British Library are engaged in very similar archiving practices. Right. So what kind of things can you do to give researchers more access? Um, that's a good question, especially because there are technical and, and cost hurdles to big data analysis with social media data. Um, so I think part of it is educational and community building. Uh, we've certainly seen the digital humanities and the Alan Turing uh, Institute and others like it uh, in, in many disciplines emerge as people become more fluent in digital tools. Um, but they, those tools don't necessarily align with archival or library practice. Uh, and those practices and theories and approaches that were used to collect the data or to describe it or to you know, give context to it uh, that would be useful for research. Um, so I think some of it is a traditional uh, support and community building and, and reference liaison kind of uh, a work. But also people are collecting a lot of data, uh, social media data as part of their research activities. Uh, and those uh, don't always end up with preservation institutions. So having a more cooperative acquisition relationship or donation, however you want to define it, uh, where people that are using social media data are making sure that it is uh, preserved and all the context that they've given it in their research uh, can, can help facilitate its use by other researchers. So it is, the, it is the archival job to sort of collect and make available and describe and make useful. So uh, social media data falls right into that bucket, but introduces a lot of challenges around the technology and the training. So it won't be a case of all the librarians are made redundant. It will just be a case of the librarians will be the ones <laughs> who can call up the data and interpret it statistically. Or maybe they just become the historians and the historians become redundant. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I was required to have one provocative comment, so I just had to get it out of the way. <laughs> well, we may be, but I just 
a plug for the Internet Archive. It's doing the really valuable work with, with, that Jefferson's talking about. It's stock of texts, old-fashioned printed texts, is remarkable and wonderfully accessible and has made my practical job as an historian over the last five years change radically. Uh, and it may one day empty out the British Library. <gasps> no, uh, they're one oh, of our best partners. There are fewer people. <sighs> the footfall is declining, I think, and, and, and certainly in because so much now is available online, and thanks to the work of Jefferson and his colleagues. Can, can I? You're to cut in here before before we have infighting between the, <laughs> the British. I think the British Library are also doing a lot of digital archiving. I should say this that it's not only in the church in San Francisco. There's probably a big cellar next door that's also full of ones and zeros. <laughs> That's how it works, right? <laughs> <laughs> Helen, could I just yeah add to that point? I mean. We, uh, the, the social media have had a lot of bar bad press for you know, being unable to forget. Um, and in fact, my, my uh, colleague, Victor Meyer Schoenberger, wrote quite a well-known book called Delete about how we should sort of have compulsory sell-by dates on, 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 on things and that social media doesn't let us forget. But there is another sense, I think, in which social media makes it all too easy for um, political institutions in particular to forget things they don't want to remember. Um, so I would like to point to one particularly brilliant use of the Wayback Machine. So after the Brexit vote, um, the Leave campaign actually d tried to delete their website, including all images of that bus with the 350 million on the site. Um, and with the help of some avid Twitter users and the Wayback Machine, it was restored. Um, and it's there now if you want to take a look. I think the bus now says 150 million. Somehow they managed to actually change the amount on the image of the side of the bus, but it's, it is there. And I mean, I, I think actually providing, there's an important point there about how archives can provide a kind of institutional memory, if you like. And we've got to think quite carefully about how to do that, because as you pointed out, I, I mean, it's impossible. It's impossible. For the, the, there's 1.7 billion people on Facebook, OK? Uh, uh, it's just <coughs> in, I, impossible to think about it, apart from all the legal and ethical and logistical problems. But in the sense of providing a kind of political and social memory of things, it's between the people who study those things. Does it, this is data in the wild, and we're not used to data in the wild. The census data is, you know, this carefully collected, tamed, groomed data, you know, all tidy and organised. Um, and we're talking about, you know, wild, savage data. <laughs> you know, roaming totally free across the roaming, spreadsheets. Roaming free, you know, un uncollated, untamed, if you like. We've got to think of the right level of sort of taming yes. into the archive. Yes. Well, that was actually, that was going to be my other question was, is there a danger that we have the illusion of completeness, which is often the case with big data, that you go, oh, well, you know, N equals all, and we have everything, and we have the whole of the internet, although apparently we don't. Uh, but that, you know, you have the fire hose of Twitter, you have everything, and that you somehow think that you therefore have all the thoughts of everybody and that by doing a sentiment analysis on Twitter, that will tell you what the world is feeling about something at a, a given time. But as you say, there's actually not that many people on Twitter. Uh, it's probably us in this room and some journalists. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but, uh, but do we not all slightly subscribe to that thing of we, we because, it's, because it's so big, because there's so many people, we kind of think, well, that, that represents everybody then. Is, is there a danger of that? And how do we, how do we avoid that? Well, we have to think what the point is. So, I mean, I could have here shown an image. Um, some very, very um, clever engineers, um, a university engineers, have, have, have devised something called the Twitter mood, and there's a face, and it takes in, it sucks in the whole of the Twitter fire hose, and it moves, you know, and it's the mood of the nation. And it's really, really clever, but is there any point in it? I mean, really, you, you, you know, it's everything. <laughs> but until you think about why you're, what, what you want to, what the interesting questions are to ask about that, um, then, you know, it may not be worth that much. <laughs> well, on a positive note, you know, uh, arguments are always circumscribed by the source data that they work with. So, I mean, before the digital era, people made arguments and wrote books and did all sorts of... Uh, 
you know, speculation about what societies were like based on very limited amounts of information that often represented very, very narrow segments of society. So I think that case has always existed. It just feels more, it, it evokes more anxiety now because you're more aware of the limited nature of it because we're all so awash in data and oh my God. So I don't think the situation has changed, but I think the sort of self-awareness around it seems to, yes, have changed. Uh, the failure of the political science community is to predict any of the major <laughs> <laughs> events of the last uh, 18 months uh, would suggest that it's not actually that easy to uh, manage this information. I, I, I'd just make two points. One, to kind of reiterate what I was saying in my favor, the Facebook users uh, are heavily concerned with their emotional lives. Um, and they know that what's on Facebook is a construction of those lives, not the full scope of its reality, both in terms of what's on Facebook and also in terms of all the other communications that they engage in outside of the digital media. So that is, I think, a real caution. A second caution is, is about generation. To an extraordinary extent, we are focused now on young men and women between the age of about 14 and 19. Now, it's not the first time in history by any means that what we now call adolescents are seen to embody everything that's problematic in our own society and, 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 to, and are seen to, to predict what's going to happen uh, in the future. Um, but it ain't necessarily so. Most of the people in this audience, I would imagine, have devoted their grown-up lives to trying not to behave as they did when they were 15, particularly in their emotional and sexual lives. That's the point of being grown up. And we don't yet know all that much about how digitally infused 16-year-olds grow up to be 30 or 40 or 50-year-old citizens. It's, it's, we need longitudinal data of a sort which is just about unattainable, I think. But I remember seeing a Pew survey which asked the question, of people in long-established relationships, what part in those relationships do digital media play? And unsurprisingly, it just declined off a cliff over age. So by the time you got to people in their 60s, the digital media were completely irrelevant to how they were managing their private lives. So you really wouldn't expect otherwise, really. But it's a caution about building all of our knowledge about how the world is and is going to change on the basis of this very small cohort of the population. Now, I would love to just keep these guys talking for the next 40 minutes, but that's not my job. <laughs> uh, thank you for being so patient. I'm now going to come out and, uh, and hear what you have to say. Am I right in thinking we have a roving microphone? Is, is that it coming down the... Bye. Wave to me, roving microphone person. Stand, all oh right, okay, it's down here. Um, so please wait till the microphone comes to you because we are recording this for posterity. Uh, as I say, if, you, if you're not meant to be here, put on a different accent. And I will take, in order to try and get through as many of you as possible, I will take a couple of points at a time, try and keep them concise, uh, and then I will let our panel respond as they wish. So stick your hand up if you would like to say something. Oh, there you go. Well, let's take you two to start with then, and then we'll come over to this side. Hi, thank you very much for this really interesting discussion. My name is Bettina Friedrich. I currently work at UCL, and my background is clinical psychology and media psychology, so I'm very interested in this topic. And I want to follow up uh, on a point you just said about what people say on Facebook doesn't always represent reality, but how they want to present reality. As a clinical psychologist who's also interested in personality, this is particularly interesting for us, actually. Um, there's the expression Facebook happy, which means people are not actually happy, but they use Facebook to portray a life that is really happy, because, because we are all supposed to be happy and enjoying life. This is like something for the statues. Um, and so it's really interesting how people try to represent themselves on Facebook for psychologists this can be a, a really great source for research. Uh, but I agree that if you are historically interested in what the re reality really is or has been, this can be tricky because it's subjective. 
Very mm -hmm. useful point. Thank you. And uh, across, straight across there. Uh, my name's <coughs> Jonathan Adams. I work for a company called Digital Science, which is based with Macmillan, just the other side of King's Cross from here. And we're a portfolio company. So we, one of our, our companies is altmetric.com, which makes use of uh, social media data um, in uh, analyzing what academics and others are tweeting and blogging and, and so on. Um, but in, in, in the context of th this debate, uh, there are two questions I wanted to ask. One was social media data. Where are you drawing a boundary between social media and any other form of data? Because actually in looking at the use of social media data, you're almost certainly going to bring in a wide range of other data. And actually, that, 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 there's a very gray area between what is social media data and what is another form of data. So, so actually, the use of, of bicycles in London is, is not obviously social media, but actually, it's a social activity. And you can get a huge out of, uh, amount of information out of what people in London are doing, down to a very personal level, from analyzing those data. And you can tie it in with other things. And the second question is that, that I felt Perhaps the, the, the debate has been a little bit on the negative side about problems with social media data and hasn't really emphasized utility and given examples of use and thought through all the positive things that can actually come out of being able to use very big data sets which then provide a range of information on transport use, uh, environment, other activities. Okay, thank you. Well, since this gentleman managed to squeeze in a company plug and two questions, <laughs> which I don't encourage, uh, I, shall, I shall let the panel come back now, if you like, and then I'll come out and get some more. I think, uh, I think we have some over that side, if you'd like to ready yourself with a microphone up that side. Uh, so, panellists, feel free to come back on any or all of those points. So we have the, can we hear some more examples of, uh, of good uses of social media data? We have the problem of linking social media and other kinds of data and where you draw the line, uh, which we haven't really raised at all yet. And the fact that people don't necessarily give a completely accurate portrayal of themselves, but that that in itself can be interesting. Who'd like to start us off? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, well, I, I, I always try not to be too ex overexcited. I mean, I'm actually very excited about data of all kinds because I'm a political scientist and the whole, political, the whole discipline of political science has existed in a sort of data desert kind of since, since it started. So um, I, I am very excited about new sources of data. Um, and working hard to think of ways, you, you know, one of the things um, we've done, for example, is a feasibility study for the Department of Work and Pensions to work out all the ways that social media um, data might show how benefits change was playing out in society. You know, how are people reacting to the move towards universal credit? Um, and so it was only a small piece of work, a feasibility study, but I, I am very excited about the possibility of policymakers using social media data to understand how policies are being experienced um, and how they m better information might be given about them and all sorts of things. And there's all sorts of examples of, uh, of, uh, of that. I think there are specific, I mean, the topic was social media data, and you're right that there's a grey area. Um, and I draw the line quite widely. Um, a lot of the analysis in our book, for example, came from petitions data. I believe that a sort of petitions platform where you have the opportunity to very easily sign a digital um, uh, petition is to all in purposes like a, it's user generated content. You're consciously generating data yourself, which you hope will uh, contribute to some kind of public or or, or, or social good. So I do see that as social media data. I think when you get to transactional data where people's participation is completely kind of, in, it's not explicit at all, it's, not, it's completely passive, so it's data about people, I'm not convinced that that would necessarily come into, in, you know, I think there's distinct questions about social media data as opposed to data where it's, it's transactional data about riding bicycles and you're generating it without thinking about it or even knowing perhaps that you're doing it. Um, it's still interesting in some ways, it, 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 more interesting, you know, there are more things you can, you, you, you can do with it, but to call it social media data I think is to lose some of the kind of 
dilemmas there are about how you use social media data and, and logistically how you use it and, and ethically how you can use it, which we have, we've only talked about privacy, we haven't touched on all the other questions about social media. So I think, I think you should still kind of maybe try and make a distinction between this kind of active social media and kind of passive data. But maybe you think that's too much pressure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, in backing up the positives and the utility, just speak to the ability of social media, be it data or records, they're all sort of records, to uh, represent marginalized and upper underrepresented communities that in the, you know, the historical perspective have not been well represented uh, as far as their lives and activities. Um, think of how a uh, political revolution would be documented in the historical record from 100 years ago. It would be largely official statements or records or police records, the actual you know, person on the street, um, documents that capture that spirit or that activity or existence um, are largely missing from the, the archive of a century ago. So social media really allows uh, us to change what the composition of the archive is and thus how the historical record and the socio-cultural record can be represented and, uh, and studied in the future. So, I mean, that's, I think, an amazing positive is just the plurality of representation that's possible um, at an item level or even, you know, full movements or communities or societies. So the revolution will not be Instagrammed. So. No, it will be, Incorrect. and we will archive it. <laughs> the revolution <laughs> will be Instagrammed. <laughs> Has been. David. Yeah, I mean, I think the printed word has left more of a, a wider record than, than, than perhaps Jefferson suggests about how the people were thinking. But to go back to counting, one of the virtues of standing where I stand in the 19th century, you can see the beginning of it. Uh, and I, I've written a bit about literacy and... and when they discovered that across a society, instead of there being an impossibly wide range of different people who could or couldn't write in different parts of the country, in different families, in different streets, and discovered that if they re-examined marriage register data, they could express the com communication capacity of society on one sheet of paper covering the entire population, it was a stunning moment. They couldn't believe that this was possible. And it wasn't until they ran the data through three or four years and it turned out to be stable uh, and to be moving very slightly in one direction that they realised that they could do something cognitively and in terms of understanding society which had been completely impossible beforehand. The Post, when they had Penny Post in 1840, that created cheap post, but they also at that point began to count letters. Never been possible before. And you get this extraordinary organisation, the Universal Postal Union, 1775, which begins to publish tables of the numbers of letters and post offices and letter carriers all the way around the world. And by 1914, you've got the entire world mapped. Uh, this was a revolution in understanding how societies worked and talked to each other, which in some ways, against what had been there before, was even greater than the modern digital uh, media have, have produced, although that, that in turn has been really important. So I mean, to answer your point, I think we can lose sight of the scale of the change that big data has made going back to the 19th century uh, in our capacity to understand the world in which we live and how people behave in it. Okay, I'm going to take some more points and questions. Um, there was, okay, yes, and I think there was another in just in front of you. So if you'd like to go first, and then the gentleman just in front of you. And meanwhile, if you'd like to take this guy as well, and then we'll go one, two, three. There you go. Okay. Um, yeah, I work in marketing, and my point is going to be biased by that. Um, the the data that gets collected with a lot of social media platforms was formed to to um, to make more money for them, and. Is there a challenge that the metrics that you get for analysis from a research point of view were put in place from a marketing point of view? And are there data points that you would like to see that aren't currently collected? Or are there ones that you feel people pay too much attention to that don't really fit with your research point of view? 
Because what seems to be the case in social media is people can find data to support whatever argument they want. And it, the, there seems to be a sort of post-big data world where people seem to be disregarding things that don't fit them because they can always find a point or a statistic that does. And I just wondered, yeah, how that, that sort of mix between marketing and research works for you because it seems to be quite different from any other kind of data points that you would collect historically. Thank you. So collecting data for one purpose and trying to use it for another. A uh, gentleman over here. Uh, hello, uh, I, I'm a program working in banking, and I want to highlight the uh, aspect of social media. Uh, it's possible that is it that a social media will cause um, different person to get treated differently in public services. For instance, I was told that in certain continents, it's now possible that you can get a loan based on your social media profile. And on the other hand, we were told that, for instance, and you apply for a certain visa into a certain country, you ask to provide your social media link as well. So I just want to highlight in this aspect, when, when, you give, when your social media presence is going to influence how you are being treated by banks, governments or something, is, uh, what's the impact of it? I mean, is it like a, a chance that you know, the less resourced, that classes can get can easily get financed, but on the other hand, when a certain president candidate comes onto power, it might get easier for him to implement certain segregation policies, as you say. Very good point. Unforeseen consequences, and you're right. There are people who get loans because of their social media, because that is their public record, because they don't have financial history and, and credit history. And you're also right that things like hiring algorithms or even human HR people may go online and look at your social history and make judgments about you. So yeah, we haven't really covered that. So if you'd all like to answer that as well, if you just make a note of that. And gentlemen over here. Hello. Um, the big surprising political changes of the last couple of years, and there have been a few, um, have Take had a lot to do bit. with uh, social media. So uh, Vote Leave and Momentum within the Labour Party and Bernie Sanders in the US. These are all, the supporters are all organising or uh, using social media and then sort of it's a big ground up movement. Uh, but there's a lot of noise there and it's difficult to see the, the real sort of popular appeal of these things. Are there things that particularly pol uh, uh, politicians can do to sort of cut through the noise of social media? and find out what's really going on uh, within those people. Thank you. Uh, so again, we've got three points, so I'll come back to the, the panel and let you respond to whatever you fancy responding to. We've got the politics question, the problem of trying to use media collected for commercial purposes for research. And the, and the much bigger question of, well, what consequences might your social media postings have that you haven't really thought about? That sounds like it might be one for you, David. I don't know if you fancy uh, tackling that. Well, I or is it not your period? I, 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 well, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think two points. One is actually an historical point. We, people used to get jobs, privileged positions, because of who they were related to which was a kind of social networking question, but of a different order. Um, and then we assumed that we could dump that and get there by examination on some kind of meritocracy. And I don't understand this, it, the change that's taking place, but as described, it sounds like trying to do the same thing all over again. Uh, but with data which has been collected for completely different purposes, and I think it is um, something that should be um, should be worried about. Uh, yeah. Caroline. Uh, yeah, the, the marketing point. Yeah. Well, that's a good. Do we live in a in a post big data world? I mean, that 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 is a really good point. I mean, in that marketing. In the marketing world, you've been much better, <laughs> you, or, or, or luckier, <laughs> or richer in terms of getting hold of this sort of data. And often, the kind of data that's useful for marketing would not be particularly useful for sort of analysing political behaviour. 
Um, and perhaps that's a part of my kind of not my pessimism, but my pessimism about getting hold of data because I mean it can be incredibly expensive. Um, you, you know, uh, and uh, obviously there's a trade. You know, there's a payoff if you're using it for marketing. Um, but in research terms, it, it 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 can be extraordinarily expensive. I mean, we were talking. I think I think the real thing is that there's a big shortage of data that can be used for, for kind of public good activities as opposed to, it's all geared towards kind of profitability. And it's much more difficult to get hold of data that could be used for public good purposes. We were talking about this a little before we came in. I mean, you can donate blood, um, but you can't donate your data. Um, and, you know, is there an argument for actually creating a, a capacity for, for being able to donate social data? Because there might be all sorts of social problems that we could tackle with that, you know, bullying, um, uh, uh, teenage depression, obesity, all sorts of, of problems that might might be tackled if you had if you had the right sort of data and if people were somehow able to donate it in a sort of socio bank or something or something like that. So I think we've got to get a lot more imaginative about thinking of ways to do that. And also, of course, linking data to other sorts of data. We're, we're really in our infancy um, in being able to um, link more traditional sorts of data like survey data to kind of transactional data or social media data. There are ways, you know, we're starting to develop ways. I mean, and if you think, I mean, part of the Alan Turing Institute is develop, to develop new ways of, uh, of using data and using data to carry out public good activities and to derive um, insight into social and political behaviour. So, um, and I can't remember the last question, but it was about politics. It was so about how you cut through the noise of the, on, on social media and get to the, the big political movements that are happening there. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose in part it's the same question that the data is not created. Such data as is created from social media organisations is not created for that purpose. And you get the same sort of gatekeeper problem with the big political parties. Um, and that's having some quite pathological effects. So in the last election, for example, you know, both the uh, two of the big data scientists from the US um, Democratic campaign, you know, Jim Messina, David Axelrod, came over, worked for the Conservative and Labour parties. Uh, uh, the Conservative Party ran a really great big data campaign. And then, you know, they were tweeting, you know, bye. And, um, you know, what, what happened? What a waste, <laughs> you know, of all that insight into how people behave and what they wanted and what their preferences were. Um, and I think you see this a lot. You see parties, uh, uh, you know, campaigning with data, but then you don't see them governing with data afterwards. So Obama really uh, pioneered the kind of big data campaign and the micro donation, you know, the phenomenon of micro donations, ordinary people giving little bits of money, taking money out of politics. Um, but then when it came to governing, it kind of rather, you know, it wasn't translated into the federal administration in ways that it might have been to kind of make better public policy. There's so that Mario Cuomo quote, isn't it, that people, politicians campaign in poetry and govern in prose. <laughs> now yeah. It, now, it, now it's... The other way around, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> now they campaign with data yeah, and campaign govern with data, on a hunch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But isn't part of the problem there precisely this kind of asymmetry of access to information that the political parties know a lot about us and they are in a position to amass lots of data about us? Uh, in the course of researching my book, just to slip another really subtle plug in, uh, <laughs> I, I read about this uh, software company which all the political parties used in the last campaign uh, and they offered this service where if somebody gives you their email address, like I think the Labour Party had a really cunning one, where you could give them your email address in order to find out which other electors have the same name as you. I didn't bother. Uh, but, but once they've got your email address, they can then link up all their interactions with you, but also all your social media activity. So they basically have a page for you where they can see what you've said, so they know how to interact with you, what you're interested in. So I looked at the website of this company. I just looked at it. I didn't sign up for anything. 
for about three weeks after that, at the top of my Twitter feed was the tweets of this software company saying, hey, you know, why, why don't you come and see what we can do for you? That was just having looked at their website. So there's this massive imbalance between what the political organisations can know about us and what we know about what they're doing and, and what data they have access to and what information they're going on <coughs> and so on. So what can we do about that? I mean, if they're basically using proprietary tools and presumably having agreements with, with the giants who do own the, the social media information, how can we redress that balance a bit and know more about the people who know more about us? Well, I, yes. I mean, I suppose a, a couple of things. I mean, I think the younger, the younger you... Sorry to mention this cohort that you're not keen on. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do know... They do know... I, I think they're, they're much smarter, and I think we're all getting, as a society, we're getting smarter about those kind of things. We... You, you know, we're getting better at recognising when something's a bot and when, you, you know, and when we're being plugged something. Um, and, and that some of the naivety about that will we'll kind of, you know, we'll get smarter over time. We won't maybe completely... Um, uh, we, we, you know, you get, always get these kind of technology spirals where everybody's playing catch-up. But we will get better at being able to tell those sorts of things and to avoid them. I think young people have much more sophisticated ideas about privacy than we give them credit for. Um, and that's why most of them have two identities on Facebook, by the way. Um, one that was when they uh, agreed to be friends with their uh, parents um, in order to get the <laughs> Facebook account. And the other one was the one they actually used. They've all left Facebook now, by the way, so they don't bother trying to well, look for them They're on Snapchat. <laughs> well, as I said, five, five platforms, one of which is, is probably Snapchat right now. Um, so, you know, I think we're getting smarter about that, 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 that kind of thing. And, and, and that's what's exciting here, because the internet, and particularly social media, is the first te technology that w citizens have domesticated and are innovating and are generating content and are innovating with faster possibly than mainstream traditional institutions and governments and corporations. And that's the first technology. I mean, any other information technology, w citizens didn't really, we didn't really sort of use it. You know, governments had a monopoly on it or corporations or whatever, you know, like you know, personal mm. computers or mainframe. It didn't make any difference to what citizens were doing in their everyday lives. And this is the first time. So we're at a quite exciting point in that sense. And I think we will, we will get, get smarter. And also, of course, it does. We shouldn't underestimate the extent to which social media allow us to shed a light on what organisations are doing and allow us to challenge what organisations... I mean, if you... You know, the revolution was tweeted. Um, <laughs> There's all sorts of <coughs> things that are problematic about that sort of mobilisation and it's not very stable and it's unpredictable and it, you know, it lacks institutions and leaders and there's all kinds of things we have to think about there. But it, it, it was, you know. <laughs> we, did, we have had major challenges to authoritarian regimes and some kind of challenge to political institutions of all kinds in almost every country in the world. So we shouldn't underestimate that, I think. <laughs> Uh, and just to provide a different perspective on the asymmetry imbalance, Twitter has told me more than I would ever want to know about Donald Trump. <laughs> um, so I, it, it can work both ways, hopefully. <laughs> um, but I, it is interesting to think of the tension between social media as a form of expression and as a commercial enterprise. Uh, and I do think Helen is right, and the people have greater awareness that it is both being co-opted for purposes that are outside of what they're intending to use it for, but it also does enable them to use it for that thing. And, and I just assume that society and culture will figure out the balance there for, for how we deal with that. In the longer term. Right, I think we have time to come out for one more round of questions. So I will, oh, you see, you, you always do this. <laughs> Audience, as a representative sample of all audiences, you always wait and then put your hands at the last minute. Okay, Bye. so what I'm gonna do, I'm going to try and take everybody's question. Uh, so we're all going to try and hold those in our minds, and then I'm going to give the panel basically their last chance to come back and answer everything, which they won't be able to do, of course. So let us start up there with the person in the red dress, I think. 
uh, and then zigzag our way down. So put your hands up properly so I can see where you are. Okay, so we're going to come down that side. So why don't you start at the front here and work up and you work down. Okay. Hello, um, I'm a 30-year-old. I've been a, a full-time Facebook user for 10 years and a part-time Twitter user for four. I, my question is about trust and picks up on what's already been mentioned. Um, a couple of months ago, um, I discovered via Facebook that the Labour Party had declined membership to a few people who had previously tweeted support for the Green Party. I was wondering if the panel thinks that's ethically right. Uh, and I'm also interested in the fact that those people who were trying to become members of the Labour Party called, them, called out the Labour Party on this via Facebook. Um, and I'm, I'm just interested as to whether you think uh, we as Facebook users should change or be more aware of our behaviour, or whether we should um, lobby the Labour Party to change their behaviour and their attitudes. Very good question. I'm capturing both sides of the, the social media and politics debate. OK, so come down here and who, stick your hands up again at the back so we can see who's next. OK, yeah, there you go. Hi. Um, you mentioned that the revolution will be Instagram, the revolution will be Twittered, or tweeted. But um, social media now has gotten more restrictive, even though there's a lot of political activ activism. When there's a big political event, social media is blocked. It's, you know, people can't really access the latest information. Since around mid-2013, when you refresh your Facebook feed, you get an older post. The more you refresh it, the older the posts that come up on your news feed. It doesn't give you the latest posts. And that's kind of... Uh, coincided with the Arab Spring and bigger revolutions and protest movements. And the fact that all this media is monitored by, you know, not so democratic states, do you think there's going to be another platform kind of come out that would be kind of more cater for political activism and kind of social movements? Another very good point. And of course, you know, in this country, people do get arrested and charged for tweeting jokes. So... We maybe shouldn't be too sanguine about it. OK, so I think someone's got the microphone there, and then we'll come to you. Good. Hello. I'm an employee of the British Library and also a millennial with at least six or seven <laughs> social media accounts. Um, the British Library Act of 1975 was created to ensure that anything published in the UK, uh, a copy was sent to, to the British Library uh, to be retained. As many hurdles as there would be to do to do it, do you think there is the justification for archival and research purposes to have uh, some sort of similar legal deposit obligation for um, for collecting social media data, or do you think that private individuals, private companies, should retain the right to keep this information in an age where it's a commercial commodity? Very good question. So, how published is social media, and should it be archived? Uh, so let's see more hands at the back so we can get the microphone to the next person. And meanwhile, you speak. My question's a bit different. Uh, I'm speaking from a research funder perspective and wondering what the panel's view is on who should be responsible for the training of the people who are analysing social media data. So should it be the responsibility of research funders or institutions or of the social media companies themselves, given that a lot of the of the researchers who do have the skills that you were talking about before move into industry rather than staying in academia should should there be more responsibility on research funders and institutions to try and retain those people for academia wow good question who's responsible for training the researchers to use the new data okay last chance to put your hands up so i can get you on the on the list yeah do you go ahead uh, so I have two related questions. One is, is anonymized social media data an oxymoron? Does it actually exist, and is it useful? And then two, um, not quite the right to privacy, but what do you think about the right to be forgotten? So some kind of time horizon or, or time event for when your data may become um, uh, less personal or less accessible. So almost two opposite questions. How anonymous should it be, and should there be a time when it disappears altogether? OK, this is your absolute last chance. If there's any, By the way, if there are only 15 to 19-year-olds in the room and you, you want to speak, this will go on the internet, so it does officially exist. <laughs> <laughs> no? OK. So, panel, uh, you have, 
I don't know, three or four minutes each, if you'd like to basically combine summing up with addressing any of those points that you'd like to. As always, people have come up with the really big, interesting, enormous questions in the last 20 minutes, which is always the way. <laughs> but I think the good news is that there is wine outside, so we can do the usual thing of completely informally and not on the public record, chew over the really difficult points over a, a glass of wine. So uh, let me take you in, can I take you in reverse order? Is that a mean trick? No. Since you've, you, you have oh, that means I have to speak? hours, yes, <laughs> yes, that means you have to go first. Um, but that was, those were good questions. Um, for whether uh, the, the Labour Green Party issue, I... Uh, is this all uh, British politics, it? which is baffling? <laughs> yeah, right. First, I don't know what those are, so... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think uh, the agitation advocacy is, I mean, what we've seen in other social media ramific, like use of social media and the ramification, uh, the sort of exposing it and advocating against it is a far more effective measure and far more, at least, democratic in spirit than, than the sort of punitive approach. So um, that's my take on that one. Fight politics with politics, not with technology. Yeah. Sure. Um, the legal deposit question was interesting. So legal deposit is the, the right to acquire stuff uh, in, in your country. Uh, and I'm not sure about that one. So we do not have legal deposit in the United States like they have uh, in the UK and in many other European countries. Um, so there are, we do have records retention acts and things that uh, for the National Archive to collect uh, agency, agency material. Uh, but they actually don't collect much social media. Uh, a little of the congressional uh, people in Congress, if they have social media accounts, they are usually considered official government records as long as they are created while they're in office and, and used for their official purposes and things like that. Um, so I do think legal deposit has been really successful in all the European countries for uh, allowing acquisition of content that might actually uh, you know, fall out of uh, other collecting activities. Uh, it's also, of course, given libraries and archives lots of funding uh, to go out and get that stuff, so that's, that's a good argument, too. Um, and I would say that social media is like other web-published materials uh, and should be included in those activities. Uh, training researchers is a, is a fantastic question, uh, and it's one that we certainly come up against because people are always very interested in using the web archive and data at scale, uh, and it has all sorts of infrastructure and technical fluency uh, challenges. Uh, and where the support lies for those, uh, funders would be great. I've got plenty of grant proposals if you're accepting them currently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is, uh, I think it is driven generally by disciplinary communities and academic networks more than the libraries and archives, which have much you know, limited support uh, for doing that sort of training. They're more focused on making it accessible and how people use it, uh, they try to help with, but uh, it, certainly funding uh, is usually community focused uh, and that does often come from funders or, or the government. Um, anonymized social media data. So I've been spending a lot of time in the Ge GeoCities web archive collection lately and I have no idea who any of these people are. Um, so. Does it become anonymized over time, sort of? Um, but that doesn't really answer people's anxiety about being uh, collected in a sort of non-permission approach. Um, I think some Twitter data, and there are ways to provide access to social media and web published data uh, in an anonymized fashion, which is uh, links and network graphs and semantic entities and things like that. Uh, that don't necessarily link back to the individual uh, tweet or artifact. Uh, and yeah, I think I'll probably in there. I, I think on the public record thing, I believe that, I mean, you work for the British Library, you probably know more than I do, but I, I think some social media is probably archived as part of the web archiving. But the UK National no, Archive. No, it isn't, no. Well, the UK no, National Archive it, collects all the Twitter it and is. YouTube of government. <laughs> Right, <laughs> government agencies. Just politicians, well, yeah. okay. Public so public figures. From the, yeah, from the general Latin and press Britain. All right, okay, there you uh, go. So would it be legal to make social media companies provide some subset from what is created within the country domain 
Um, I don't know of any that do, but I think it would be awesome. Or would there be happened. privacy questions? Would you have to respect the original privacy settings of the users? You could have embargoes, so you could and you could it's not available could for use research. it, but not somebody's mum, for example. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> not the Green Party or not the Labour Green Party. Party. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, sorry, we, we are. I'm chipping in and overrunning. David, sorry. would you like to give us your assorted thoughts? No, it's my. Um, oh, an anonymized social is not an oxymoron. There are a whole range of techniques which have been developed, as, as, as we know. We also know that it's um, dangerous to invest unthinking confidence in them. And the uh, particular point that comes to mind is the NHS records, where the attempt to sell on anon uh, anonymized health records to private companies have run into every sort of uh, trouble, and, and, and rightly so. On the issue of deleting the past, is it a very complex question? Historians are bound to get very itchy about this if they see societies or individuals being able to correct or change their past, particularly if more and more of their present is embodied in the social media. This is counter to what any historian wants to see happening. Unless you're actually changing errors in your past, I think the question isn't whether it should be deleted, but how it should be used. And to connect that to the question about um, the Labour Party disqualifying new members because they've supported the Greens in the past, any political party has got a right, and has always, I think, denied membership to people who at that same time are members of another party or very actively supporting that other party. I think that's contentious. But to deny membership because in the past they may have supported some other party, uh, which appears to be what is now happening, is an extraordinarily dangerous and uh, a foolish course to take. Winston Churchill, after all, was a Liberal Party cabinet minister for a long time before he became the world's greatest conservative prime minister. People have got an entire right to change their views uh, and to use some past social media tweet to disqualify them for their present political activity is just fundamentally wrong. Is that your closing words for the evening? Yep, that's it. Excellent. <laughs> so, Helen, Finishing if, positive. If you, could, if you could answer all the other questions <laughs> and sum up within six minutes, that would be perfect. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> they were really good questions, and I can't answer all of them in that time. The, the training point, well, yes, that is a really good point. So we, we at the Oxford Internet Institute, we do train. We have a master's degree in... Um, social science of the internet and we do train people to use this to, to use this data to gather this data etc uh, a very large number of our postgraduates then go on to work for google or, or facebook or, or these companies um, uh, and uh, lots of them go into academia too i mean i i do think uh, and, and at the Alan Turing Institute upstairs, there will be 40 PhD students, I think, starting in, in October, and they will have very advanced, um, to be developing a very advanced skills in, 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 in data science. So some of those students um, that, that I'm talking about will have research council funding, some of them won't. I think, obviously, I think that more research council <laughs> funding is needed for <laughs> this kind of training, of course. Well, how could I possibly say anything else? But I do think also that the point you make about social media companies, um, you, you know, maybe we should be looking. It's no good creating a sort of us and them environment. Well, there is a bit of an us and them environment, but we should be working to breaking that down. And we should be looking for partnerships in funding and, and apprenticeships and all, all sorts of things like that. I mean, and most university departments that do the kind of thing we do do have relationship. You know, we do have relationship with Google and. But we need to do more of that, and we need to, we need to get them participating in, in funding that training because absolutely it is the universities um, uh, that do it. So it was a really good question. Um, the point about the revolution um, and um, uh, platforms being blocked and uh, being dangerous for people to participate, all these things, all those things, of course, are absolutely true. And they were true through all the revolutions of the Arab Spring and the people who sort of took the first steps were not undertaking tiny acts of participation. They were, you, you know, they were large ones at the beginning when they were, you know, um, uh, uh, in, 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 in great danger of being identified. I mean, I, I, the, the only... I mean, yes, you're right, of course, in an ideal world that there would be this this uh, platform that was kind of, 
you know, secure and impenetrable from authoritarian regimes. Not going to happen. I mean, whenever you build, uh, you can't... These things have grown out of platforms where people are and where people are have social networks and are co communicating and coordinating with each other. And they won't, if you, if you make a place for them to do that, they won't go there. Um, and that's the problem. So it's kind of, I think we're kind of stuck stuck with where we are people will innovate they will and they will kind of draw in resources from other countries and there's a whole culture of sort of hacking platforms to give secure coordination mechanisms to people you, you, you know in, in in authoritarian regimes um, so yes of course it's a, it, it, it's a challenge it is a, a challenge that people will continue to strive to meet and I don't I, I I'm, I'm not uh, although there is the Tor underground network and, and that is one possibility where people can organise away from scrutiny. Um, I think if, you, if you're looking for a platform where you, 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 you want to get a million people on the street, you've got to go to where there are millions of people. <laughs> That's, um, that, 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 that is part of the challenge. Yes, yeah. I, and, uh, Oh, right, OK, yes. Well, I'm, I mean, yes, and, and that involves lobbying social media networks, obviously not to do that, and there are lots of people doing that, and we've got to do more of that. I mean, yeah, I couldn't agree more. The point about the Labour Party, I think that illustrates very well um, the question of how traditional um, political institutions are dealing with this kind of politics, which is, i.e., very badly. <laughs> so what you've got in both I I with the um, uh, UK Labour Party and the US Republican Party, you've got a number of parallels there. They've both had um, uh, uh, leaders, or in the US uh, candidate, uh, elected on waves of, 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 of support, you know, kind of bubbling up out of, out of social media, reflecting the way people do politics now, which is they have multiple allegiances. The whole idea of membership, as it used to be, I think is kind of dead. Um, people have multiple allegiances for multiple parties, um, and uh, uh, the traditional political institutions just can't cope. So just because you tweeted that wonderful Green Party, didn't we all tweet it, that Green Party advert with you know, the four leaders all the same, um, singing in a boy band. Didn't we all tweet that? I think that would have been enough to uh, disqualify you from voting in the left. That is ludicrous. And that implies a misunderstanding both of how politics works these days and also a misunderstanding of social media. Um, because you don't tweet something, you know, just because you, you belong to it. Um, it's, just, it's just not how it works. Um, so I think that illustrates very nicely how traditional political um, organisations have got to kind of come to terms with this as well. Well, on that slightly incomplete note, which I think is apt for such a massive question, we are going to adjourn and move outside where there will be drinks and informal conversation on smaller platforms, by which I mean people talking to each other. Uh, thank you all very much for coming and for contributing some really good points and questions. Uh, and before we go out, uh, I'd like you to thank not only our three excellent speakers, but also Maya and all the other people who organised this event, which, as she said, is the first of a series. Uh, do you know yet when the next one is? No, we don't know yet or the date of the next one. So I guess you'll have to follow British Library on social media <laughs> to find out. So on that note, please thank our three speakers. And our moderator. Uh, David Helen. Thank you.